Well, here we are, kids. Evolution with Glenn. The last episode. Unit number five. Altruism. Altruism is basically defined as helping another individual or another what we call conspecific when you could be helping yourself and when you could instead be helping yourself. Conspecific, it's from Darwin's definitions, it means members of the same species. So um, you and I are conspecifics, we're both humans. If um, you were a squirrel and you saw another squirrel, that other squirrel would be your conspecific. So altruism is generally defined as helping another conspecific member of your same species when you could instead be helping yourself. So the question here is, think about it this way. If evolution selects features of organisms that facilitate their own, their own, that's an important word, right there in this context, their own survival and reproduction. Why does altruism exist? Okay. What is that? Think about this question. Evolution selects features of organisms that facilitate their own survival and reproduction. Why does altruism exist? Scientists in the field call this the altruism paradox. It is the altruism paradox. It almost doesn't make sense. Helping others when you could be helping yourself does not seem like something that would pass the test of natural selection. So why would that exist? Why and how could altruism be the result of evolution. That is the altruism paradox. In the 1960s, the first big answer to this idea came about, and it was called kin-selected altruism. Kin-selected altruism is an idea that was developed by a guy named William Hamilton. Not Alexander Hamilton, William, another famous uh, person in the field, Alexander, well, William Hamilton. <laughs> so William Hamilton was a famous, um, famous evolutionary scientist, and he studied insects. He was a biologist and he studied bees. Bees are known as social insects. Social insects, I'm gonna sort of keep that right there. 
Social insects are insects where insect um, in which the group acts as a unit. So social insects are insects where the group acts as a unit. And an example is a beehive or a swarm of bees. So I will tell you a little story. About 15 years ago, I was working on the garden and there was a bush and I was trying to pull the bush out because the bush didn't look good and I wanted to put in a new bush. So I went down on my hands and knees and I grabbed the root of the bush and I accidentally put my hand right into a hole filled with bees. I got stung about 20 times and I started crying like a baby. And I ran inside and said to my wife, Kathy, I've been stung by bees. <laughs> and my arms at it, both arms, and I had it on my face, and I had bee stings everywhere. It was not good. I can laugh about it 15 years later. It was very painful. Bees are amazing because they are a swarm, and in many bee species, often, the bee dies after stinging. And it dies after stinging for a specific function. It stings animals. It is a great adaptation, by the way, the bee sting. It stings animals to keep them away from the hive. So stinging benefits the hive Okay, the hive is the group of bees. You might have hundreds or even thousands of bees in a hive. So stinging an animal or a human benefits the hive at a cost to the individual bee. So often a bee dies after stinging, so the stinging benefits the hive at a cost to the individual bee. This seems strange from an evolutionary perspective. William Hamilton discovered something amazing. He kind of figured it out. Bees and a lot of other kinds of social insects, including many kinds of wasps, many kinds of ants, many kinds of termites, many species of insects that are social insects have a unique kind of genetic makeup. kind of genetic makeup. Without getting into too many details, I will tell you that the bees are very strongly interrelated to one another. Bees are very strongly interrelated to one another. So in humans and in all mammals, a father and daughter are related to each other 50%. In bees, the relationship between a parent and an offspring can be as high as 
And if you're 100% related to your mother, then anything that you do that helps your mother, 100% helps you. Helping others in the hive helps one's own reproductive success. This sentence here is the big insight that Hamilton had. That helping others in the hive helps one's own reproductive success. That bee that stung me and died helped its hive. I will tell you, I never put my hand in that hole again. So it's very effective. That is what we call, nowadays we use the phrase the hive mind or the hive mentality. It is when a group thinks as a single organism. In nature, we tend to see this in specialized kinds of animals where their genetics are so that they are very interrelated to one another. So Hamilton, in the 1960s, came up with the first answer of why does altruism exist, or how could altruism exist. Answer number one, kin-selected altruism. Um, he came up with the term inclusive fitness. With inclusive fitness, we have what he called direct fitness and indirect fitness. Direct fitness is helping your own genes directly make it into the future. Helping yourself survive, helping yourself in your own life, helping yourself find a romantic partner. These are all things that help your direct fitness. Helping yourself directly, or helping your own genes directly. but there is also indirect fitness. This is helping your genes as they exist in the bodies of others. helping your genes as they exist in the body of others. There are some people in the world who share a lot of your genes. The people who we share a lot of genes with are called kin. Genetic family. Helping kin is helping your own genes indirectly. So that is why we have the term indirect fitness. So kin-selected altruism is helping kin to indirectly help your own genes make it into the future. One of the clearest examples of kin-selected altruism we see in the natural world is with the social insects. We also see kin-selected altruism in other situations. Um, an example um, can be found in the ground squirrels of the northwestern United States. So this is a famous example. 
Um, after Hamilton showed that we can understand altruism in, in social insects such as bees, he started thinking about how even in mammals and other non-insects, we can imagine a scenario where individuals help kin disproportionately at a relatively high rate because helping kin helps your own genes in the bodies of another. Classic examples found in the ground squirrels of the north of northwestern United States. So here's the United States. Here we are in New York. 20 years ago, maybe more like 25 years ago, I used to live out in Oregon. This part of the, this part of the country is called the Northwest, the northwestern part of the United States. There are great mountains in Oregon. And I used to hike there all the time. And I remember learning that in the Northwest, they had ground squirrels. In New York, where we live, we have squirrels. But they are in trees. They are what's called arboreal. In trees. So you'll see a squirrel sometimes on the ground, but they usually live their, the majority of their lives up in the trees. So that's what I'm used to having lived in New York for a long time. For two years, I lived in Oregon. And Oregon's squirrels are ground squirrels. The ground squirrels cannot climb trees, but in the woods, there are a lot of holes. There are rocks and there are holes and there are trees that have fallen and the ground squirrels live underground. I had heard about them, but I saw them one time and I was very excited. I used to go hiking in these mountains with my dog, who was named Murphy at the time. She was a very sweet dog and she used to run up and down the mountains with me. And I'll never forget it. I once saw a ground squirrel when I was hiking with Murphy, my dog, and the ground squirrel stood up on a log and it eeked. It was like eek. And it got my dog's attention, and Murphy went to chase the ground squirrel, and the squirrel went right into a hole, and Murphy did not get the squirrel, thank goodness. But I was seeing a famous example of evolution in action. So, of course, I was very happy with that. Um, research, what I witnessed was something called the alarm call. of the ground squirrel. Think about the alarm call. If you are a ground squirrel and there is a predator, like a big dog, who can eat you, would it be better to just run in the hole or to first scream and get the dog's attention and then run in the hole? For your own survival, you would be better off just running into the hole quietly. So the alarm call, when they stand on the log and scream, is very dangerous. Because the first squirrel that would get eaten is the one giving the alarm call. Which raises the question, why? Why do the ground squirrels in the northwestern United States give the alarm call? How did that evolve? What has been found is that the alarm call, or research has shown, that squirrels only give the alarm call nearby. So in this research, they tagged a whole bunch of ground squirrels so they could identify individual ground squirrels. They knew which ones were related to which other ones. And they looked at 
whether they gave the um, alarm call or not. They found, this is what their graph looked like. Um, this is the percentage of kin in the area. And here we have the probability of giving the alarm call. And if there are, this could be high, and this could be low, and this could be low, and this could be high. And if there are a lot of kin in the area, especially close kin, brothers, sisters, daughters, sons, they are very likely to give the alarm call. And if there are no kin, if all the other squirrels are unrelated, they are less likely to give the alarm call. And the graph from the research paper looks like this. If there are a lot of kin, you tend to see a lot of probability of the alarm call. And if there are very few kin, you tend to see very low probability of giving the alarm call, which suggests that the alarm call itself is an altruistic act. But it is altruism that is dedicated specifically to helping genetic relatives. So Hamilton was definitely correct. Part of the reason we see altruism is because of a very strong tendency to help individuals who are related, which is, as Hamilton himself said, helping your genes as they exist in the bodies of others. Does kin-selected altruism exist in humans? Think about that question. Does kin-selected altruism exist in humans? Well, one answer we can give is we can think about parenting. We've already talked a little bit about parenting. Parenting is helping your offspring. Helping your offspring is helping vehicles for your genes into the future. And specifically, think about the role of the mother. Moms are the best. And the reason that moms are the best is because the most investment of resources and time that any human gets is almost always from the mom. Even just being pregnant is a huge investment. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of calories, it is dangerous, there can be complications. So that is a big way that your mom helped you. Childbirth is a very big deal. That is a huge tax on the mother, but it benefits the offspring, obviously. So childbirth, feeding, so we can think about pregnancy, childbirth, feeding, And that's not all, right? Mothers provide more help, energy, and resources to individuals than just about anyone else, just by the fact of their being a mom. So parenting is kin-selected altruism. Mothers, in particular, engage in kin-selected altruism. But also, um, in humans, Kin selected altruism extends beyond parenting. So I'll give you another example. 
There's research by a guy named Killian Garvey. And Garvey, he has research on what he calls the trolley problem. In the trolley problem research, people think about what they would do in a situation. So a trolley is like a train. And there are two tracks. And here are the train tracks. And in the trolley problem, you are asked to imagine that there's a big switch a big lever that you can pull. Here's your hand, and that's you. And you have a choice. Here comes the train, here comes the trolley, and it's either gonna go down this track or down this track. And the way it is presented to you, there are different people stuck on these different tracks. So what Garvey specifically was interested in was do people behave in the trolley problem example in a way that disproportionately helps Kim? So you are given a written example. So you are told something like this. Um, imagine that if you pull the lever, five strangers die, and three family members So imagine that if you pull the lever, five strangers die, and three family members live. I'll put the number there. Okay, so here, I'll draw it. Here's your three family members. And here's one, two, three, four, five strangers. People you don't know. What he found was that most people will save their family members even if there are only few. Most people who are presented with this problem choose to save the family members. Even if they are few. even if they are few in number. So most people who take this will pull the switch to save their three family members and sadly killing the five strangers. That is our evolved psychology. Think about that. Look at that picture. I just love it. All right, I'm going to raise it. Kin selection. Kin selected altruism. Why does altruism exist? One reason altruism exists is because sometimes we help others who are our kin and thereby we are helping ourselves indirectly. A 
second kind of evolved altruism is found in what we call reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism is an idea developed by Robert Trivers, who we spoke about earlier. And reciprocal altruism helps us to understand this other question, which is why does altruism between non-kin exist? We can understand helping kin or helping family from an evolutionary perspective, but that opens up the question for why does altruism between non-kin exists. William Hamilton did not answer that question, but he did answer a lot of important questions. The next big answer to the altruism problem was put forward by Trivers, reciprocal altruism. He essentially argued this, that under some conditions, Organisms help each other with an understanding of receiving help back. So, under some conditions, organisms help each other with an understanding of receiving help in return. If my help helping you today leads to you helping me tomorrow, and I help you the next day, and then you help me the next day, then you and I both will get a lot of help in our futures. And that will be helpful for both of us. This is called reciprocal altruism. Example. Vampire bats in Texas. There's a famous bridge in Austin, Texas. Um, this is also in the United States. Here's the Northwest, here's California. Here's Texas, Louisiana, there's Florida. So there's the United States again. You can tell I like geography. And Austin, Texas is about here, so it's south. The south, if you ever come when you come to the United States, you'll see that Texas is a very different place than New York. Um, it's very far in the South, and people sort of speak differently and do things a little differently down there. Um, a famous thing about Austin, Texas, is there is a bridge, and underneath the bridge in the city, about a million vampire bats sleep each night. under one bridge. Um, so you can imagine there's a body of water, here's the bridge, and here's the bats. And the bats are famous, it's a, a thing to do if you go to Texas, if you go there at about sunset, when it starts to get dark, you will see thousands and thousands of bats flying out at night. Here's what they do. They fly out and they look for food. They're vampire bats, so they bite mammals. Usually not people, 
usually cows. And after they bite the cow, they get the cow's blood, they come back. They don't always succeed. Some of them succeed, find a cow, bite it, and get blood. Some of them do not. And if you go back to the bridge and you did not get any food, you are probably hungry. The bats have a very interesting form of altruism. The bats will regurgitate, that's a kind of nasty word, blood to help others who got no food. So a bat will come back, and if there's some another bat that didn't get any food that night and is very hungry, the bat who got food will regurgitate, kind of disgusting, and the hungry one will eat that blood, is what they do. <laughs> that's, that's what bats do. Here's an interesting thing. They will not help just any other bat. Helping is discriminatory. Helping is discriminatory. There's two kind of bats that they will help. Helping of kin. They will help their brothers, their sisters, their fathers their mothers, their young, their offspring, but they will also help others who have helped them in the past. So but these bats will help non-kin who have helped them in the past. In short, they will help their friends. From an evolutionary perspective, we can think of this as what a friend is. A friend is someone whom you can count on to help you in the future and that you can get and they can count on you to help them in the future and vice versa into the future. Um, that's kind of what a friend is. Someone <clears throat> with whom you have a reciprocal altruism-based relationship. You can count on each other. You can trust each other. You know that you will be able to ask that individual for help at any time. Humans definitely engage in reciprocal altruism. One of the reasons that helping exists, one of the reasons that we see altruism in humans is because of the large-scale presence of reciprocal altruism. I'm going to put up two more. So those, in combination, kin-selected altruism and reciprocal altruism, with those two ideas, we can understand so much about helping in humans and so much about why people give of themselves to others. There are two other ideas I want to talk about before wrapping up. One of them is called multi-level selection theory. I'll talk about it as multi-level selection and altruism. 
The idea of multi-level selection and altruism is basically the idea that in a species that is social, in other words, with groups, helping others to help your group can evolve. Helping others to help your group can evolve. It's called multi-level selection. It's an idea put forward by a person named David Wilson. And multi-level selection means that sometimes you have groups that are fighting against each other, competing with each other, and you have individuals within each of those groups. And if an individual behaves in a way that helps that group do better than the other groups, that individual will benefit and the entire group will benefit. Um, an example has to do with video games. So a lot of video games have what is called solo mode versus what we call squad mode. Sometimes if you're playing a video game, it is you against everybody else. And if it is you against everybody else, you're probably going to be selfish. You probably are not going to help other players because you have nothing to gain, you will get no benefits from helping the other players. That is called solo mode. But in a lot of those same video games, you can play as a team. In the United States, the kids call that squad mode, or we might call it team mode. If you are playing in team mode, everything changes. If you're playing in team mode, it benefits each individual to help the team. It benefits each individual to help the team. So sometimes altruistic behavior or helping comes about because we are on teams. Humans are very social. We do things in groups. Sometimes our teams are small. It could be a team of four of us playing a video game against other teams. Sometimes our teams are bigger. Um, it could be I'm on a football team that has 50 people on it. Sometimes we see teams at a bigger level, like a nation, for instance. I know that China has a very proud identity for the nation. It's almost like the nation of China is a team. In the United States, we also have a very proud national identity. Not everyone, but this is a big, a big thing. And people are proud of their country, seeing the entire country as a team. When you see a large group as a team, people see benefits of helping anyone on that team in all kinds of ways. So this is one of the other ways that altruism comes about in humans. Finally, I will talk about friend selection. And mate selection. And altruism. If you're thinking about someone that you would want for, quote, a mate, which would be a husband or a wife at some point, and you think about if you want that person to be selfish or if you want that person to be helpful, most people report that they want their partner to be helpful. 
That same finding exists when we ask people about what they want for their friends. Most research shows that most people want friends and mates who are not selfish but who are helpful. So this is kind of a simple reason, in humans at least, that altruism exists. Because in humans, we have a very strong preference for people in our worlds who are helpful. If you were asked to choose between two people to marry, and one of them was very selfish and nasty and only wanted whatever he wanted, and the other one was super nice and said, what can I do to help you? And you're gonna be with that person for the next 50 or 60 years, you probably want the helpful person and not the selfish person. If you're thinking about people that you want for friends, you probably want a friend who is helpful to you rather than a friend who is selfish. And because of that tendency, we tend to sometimes be helpful because if we're not helpful, we will not get along well with other people. So co cooperation and helpfulness in humans has thus been rewarded or been naturally selected. So next time you think about why should I be helpful to someone else, there's all kinds of evolutionary based reasons or answers to that particular question. I just want to say that I want to thank you so much for being part of this class. Um, teaching you is actually a joy to my heart and I look forward to working with you all and continuing to working with you all and I look forward to you coming to New York in the future and we really enjoy hosting our students from your university and we look forward to having a good time. Um, I also just want to give a shout out. I want to give gratitude, love and appreciation to my daughter Megan who is holding the camera and is producing these videos. And thank you very much. This has been Evolution with Glenn.